voice of the northeast lmfm my next guest this friday on late lunch is making a return visit to the show last time he was here he trekked across swedish lapland this time 430 kilometres. God, there's some walking in that across desert terrain in Iceland was where Paul Shields found himself recently. Little did he know that the relatively dormant Bardabunga volcano that he crossed was about to go wild. Hey, Paul, did you stick your foot in there? No, hey, Jerry, no, it, it was nothing got to do with me. <laughs> I don't think so anyway. I hope not. <laughs> An Irishman puts his foot in the volcano, yeah, runs it. home, and the whole all hell breaks loose. <laughs> thanks so much for uh, joining me yeah, again thanks for having on me, the Jerry. show. I always remember our chat last time you were here. It was really fascinating. So last time, as I said, it was Swedish Lapland. This Iceland trek, is it slightly below the... I- Iceland lies immediately below the Arctic Circle. If you stand on the most northerly point of Iceland and look north, you're only a few hundred metres away from the Arctic Circle. So it's immediately below the Arctic Circle. Why Iceland? Well, Iceland, as I'm into the outdoors, and I've always known that Iceland is an intensively outdoor country. So over the years, I've always tied with the idea of going to Iceland. Although I've never done much research into it. I've seen a few photographs and things like that. I didn't know much about it. And then in 2010, I trekked for about 300 kilometres across the Scottish Highlands. And when I came home, I discovered that everybody was in an uproar about some volcano called Eyjafjallajökull Jökull that erupted in Iceland. And I had known absolutely nothing about it. So this kind of rekindled my interest. And I tried to recap on all the news that was happening over the last few weeks. And this brought me, it, it rekindled my interest in Iceland. I studied up about it. I learned a lot about the place. And immediately I said, that's it, I have to go. Now, when you're in Ireland, here in the North East, and you decide I'm going to Iceland for a trek, how many days were you away? I was away for 24 days. It's a long time. It's a long time to be away, yeah. And I d- you have yeah. to plan to be away 24 days. What I'm trying to get to is... Do you work on this extensively before you go, planning everything, where you fly into, where you're going to start from and where you're going to go? Yeah, I do. It it takes a lot of time. And there's often days there I could get up in the morning and I could unfurl maps on the kitchen table and I could spend eight hours studying maps all day long. I'm online studying up about the volcanoes, the terrain. Yeah, it it takes a lot of time. This was months and months in the planning. It it was probably 12 months in the planning. Mm. There was a lot of work involved in it. So there's a huge block of work before you ever go there. So then that the 20 odd days seem small from the the time you've actually put in beforehand. You fly into Reykjavik? I flew into Reykjavik and the following day then I took an internal flight up north to a town called Accuary. And uh, so it was from the north of the country where I started. There's what what you call the ring road in Iceland. There's a road that runs all around the coast of Iceland. Iceland is about one and a quarter times the size of Ireland. And if you can picture that with this ring road that follows the coast all the way around and the whole interior is completely uninhabited. There's nothing there. Nobody lives there. So it's a huge, huge, vast area. And what I done was I left the ring road in the north and I just started walking south and I hiked I think uh, for about 18 days until I finally reached the ring road on the south (laughs) yeah and it's something that I never actually uh, understood population wise in Iceland that they're all coastal dwellers and that the heart of the country no Mm. you mean literally deserted it's 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 complete the interior is completely uninhabited now Jerry it's not only uninhabited it's also classed as being uninhabitable so you couldn't live there you can't live there and I'm trying to think, the the road goes around the country. There are no roads then into that interior. There there are no roads going into the interior. Now, there's, I suppose, I I wouldn't call it a road. I suppose I'd call it a route. Now, Mm. some people do uh, travel across this interior in these big souped up four by four jeeps. So people do often cross them or sometimes people can cross them on Icelandic horses. But I decided I was going to go on foot. 
On your own. On my own, yeah. With your backpack on your back. With my backpack on my back and my boots on my feet. You had a mobile phone? I had a mobile phone with me and very straight, I was very, very surprised. I, w- I had coverage every single day of the hike. I was able to ring home, I was ta- talking to my wife uh, every evening anyway. As I camped up, I'd ring my wife, which was very strange. Like, I- I'm talking, you're hundreds of kilometres away from anywhere. But I had mobile phone At the top covered. of the world. God, you could mm. go to a patch down here and allow them eat somewhere and you wouldn't have served. That's true, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a strange phenomenon. Well, that's good that you had that. And yeah. actually a, a comfort to have the phone as well mm. in case anything went wrong. Absolutely. So you head off that first day. What was the weather like? Uh, well... People, I suppose people are expecting it to be freezing and all when you mention Iceland. But yes. very strangely, when I started off for the first few days, I was hiking in temperatures of about 20 degrees Celsius. Now, with a very heavy pack on my back, about 27 kilos on my back and the rough terrain, it was very difficult. But as I, as I went further south and began to reach the Vatna Yokel ice cap, which is the largest ice cap in Europe, the largest ice cap in the world outside of the poles, the temperature immediately began to drop down to about, I think one day it was about two degrees Celsius. Cold? Cold, yeah. And it snowed. There was one day I'd snow all day, little snow flurries all day. But when the snow landed on the ground, it immediately melted away. But it just it goes to show the extremes in, in weathers that, that I came across when I was there. A very windy place. It, near the, the ice cap, it creates its own weather and the cold air comes off the ice cap and flows across the, the deserts kicking up dust storms and a very very windy place there's times you'd have winds in excess of 100 kilometres an hour there and there is no uh, no shelter no cover whatsoever it's, it's, a lot of it is flat landscape on the deserts and it's kicking up dust and you just can't get out of out of the wind you can't get out of the, the dust storms that makes it very difficult Was the terrain flat then? Mostly flat? Uh, mostly for the first week it, w- it was flat Flat, flat-ish. I, I was crossing lava fields, the largest lava field in the world I crossed. I crossed a, a black sand desert, black volcanic ash, the Odadaran Desert, which is the largest desert in Europe. I crossed that as well. A lot of that terrain was flat, but it meant there was no shelter whatsoever and a very, very windy place. For the next two weeks then, I began to come into the, the Icelandic highlands and I was climbing over mountains and volcanoes and the terrain was completely different to there, you know, so... So you had a contrast and different parts of yeah, your trip yeah, from I, flat I, yes. to mountainous. Yeah. Th- that flat desert part, because uh, you carried your little tent or bivouac or whatever yeah. on your back that you pitched each evening... If you're in a desert with nothing around you, do you just pitch it on the on the ground? I, I just I just pitched the tent on top of the sand, and what I done was I, I dug sand and I threw sand all around the the bottom of the tent so wind wouldn't blow under the, the fly sheet. I, I was dug in, I suppose you could say, <laughs> yeah. But um, I had to use a special a specialized tent with uh, many cross poles on it that would withstand high winds. You know, there's a little knack of how you're going to pitch your tent, make it aerodynamic and that type of thing. You so know? it's not a question of, uh, I have this picture in my mind, this little V-shaped thing that you just put uh, on the ground. Should no, it be whipped, no, you'd, whipped away? You'd be like Mary Poppins over the mountains. Up in you know, the you'd, air. You'd be gone. And gone on you. <laughs> yeah, and gone, yeah. When you go out on a trek like this on your mm. first day and the first night you pitch up or you pitch camp, do you ever get concerned or lonely or worried that you're there with yourself and there's nobody else around, just you and the elements and whatever else? No, that's something I I, I don't. I, I never get that feeling. I, I love being out there on my own. I, I think it's, a, it's one of the most empowering experiences I've ever had. To be there on your own for many days and and not to be defined by other people around you. And you really become yourself. You really find out who you're supposed to be. It's, it's, I, I don't know, it's very hard to explain, mm. but you're brought right down to um, a level where uh, what you experience is real. It, it's not false. It's not, you're away from the cities and the hustle and bustle and all what's going on in that place. You really become yourself in these places. And, you know, I, I don't mind my own company. So... It's it's water off a duck's back. I'm just me. thinking that if you had any concerns or you had that little worry or whatever, mm. it would be something that would unnerve you. You couldn't feel like that. 
No, you couldn't. You have to keep a clear mind. Mm. I mean, if if you're out there and you're worried about this and that and the other and you know, what's going to happen, this, that, you know, you might as well not be there because yeah. the chances are you'll probably worry yourself into some situation that you won't get yourself out of. Keep a clear mind and, you know, you'll be OK. And that's a good piece of advice for life, never it mind is, when yeah. you're trekking. It, it is, it's true. And when, you co- when I come home from these places, I find that I can get through life much easier. It, 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 it makes you a better person when you come home. He's our intrepid adventurer from County Meath. He's with me on late lunch, Paul Shields and me, going to uh, yap more after the break. What did you eat? Um, I brought a lot of high energy foods with me. The morning time now was simple. It was either porridge or muesli. And then come lunchtime, a lot of the time I ate lunch on the move. I just took out of my pockets some energy bars, protein bars, and I ate them on the move. And then in the evening time, I ate freeze-dried, very high-energy meals that backpackers would use. I suppose some people would probably call it astronaut food. But, uh, you know, it it was appetising, it tasted nice, and I was taking in about 3,000 calories a day, every day, but I still lost weight when I came home. It wasn't enough. It, it wasn't enough. Now, I didn't feel hungry when I was there, mm. but um, I did have to adjust my belt a few times. And when I came home, my wife was shocked. I was on a strict diet of Ben and Jerry's ice cream when I came <laughs> home. So, yeah, I lost a lot of weight, but uh, now I didn't feel hungry when I was there. But I just, I just walked the weight off me. You know? Back to that food. Is that something that... Was it hot food or cold food when it you was, said it was tasty? Yeah, it, it was hot. The dinners were hot food. Does it self-heat? That's... Um, no, uh, I didn't use a self-heating. It was freeze-dried I used, so I had to rehydrate it myself. I brought along a little camp stove, a little gas stove, okay. and I heated up water, and I just poured the water into this, this bag. And it does and the I magic. And the bag. It does all the magic for mm. you, you know. For match get smash. Do that's you remember it. it? Yes, I do indeed. <laughs> Many years <laughs> yeah, back. yeah, yeah. So th- that's the way, and it was tasty, mm. and, you know, the nutrition is all there for you as well. No, you, you wouldn't light a fire, so there's hardly anything in the There place. was nothing there. There was some stretches where I hiked. I think there was two or three day stretches. I didn't even see a blade of grass, Jerry. Mm. There was no life whatsoever, not even an insect on the ground. Nothing but black volcanic sand and solidified lava. It's like a lunar landscape you yes, describe. Yes, and uh, in uh, pre-1969, uh, the up- uh, before the Apollo missions, when Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins were going to the moon, this is where they trained. They'd done all their training in the Odadaran Desert in Iceland. And when I was there, I could see why it really does look like the moon. It's a very lunar landscape, very Tolkien-esque. So I'd be... Remiss, well, it'd be stupid of me, really, to ask you, did you meet a creature or an animal? There wouldn't be much out there. There, there wasn't much. Hmm. Now, mostly what I seen was the odd board, yeah. but not many. There was one day I seen some geese flying overhead. There was one particular day I'd hiked for three days and didn't see absolutely anything. And on the third day, a little small snow bunting, a little honest human board of the Arctic, about the size of a sparrow here in Ireland, came and landed right down beside my feet. I looked up at me and started chirping. And I, I thought that was amazing. Mm. It's like, you can't, you can't walk into a supermarket or a shop or, or a travel agent and w- with a wallet full of money and say, well, look, I want to buy this experience. I want to go off and I want to experience X experience. It's something you can't buy. You have to go there looking for it yourself. Now, it doesn't, you know, it's, people might say, oh, well, what about a big bear or a big moose? And I'm only talking about a little honest human board. Yes. But the experience was amazing after seeing nothing for, for the last few days. You describe yeah. it tremendously. Yeah, I yeah. can just picture it mm. and you've put us in the picture with it there. The, I mentioned the, the eruption or the, the impending eruption of the, of the uh, Bardabonga, Bardabonga. Uh, volcano there. You, you were in that area? I, yes, I was. But there yeah. was no sign of anything when you were I, there? I didn't see a sign of anything when I was there. There was once or twice, uh, I, I mentioned it to my father when I came home, that I wasn't quite sure, but I thought I felt some sort of a tremor under my feet. Mm. In a way that when I'm at home in Nav and when Tara Mines blasts under the ground, I, I can often feel something under my feet in my house. Mm. And it was that type of thing I felt when I was there. Now, whether it was Barda Bunga doing its Bunga Bunga, <laughs> I, I, I'm not too sure. <laughs> but you did come close or you just missed a, a real major event in another one. I did. There's a volcano called Askia. 
it's one of Iceland's largest volcanoes and it's a, a very deadly volcano. I climbed the volcano up, right up onto the, the crater rim and I had planned to hike a lot around the crater rim to the south side of the volcano and down and on my way. But I, hadn't, I didn't meet many people when I was there at all. But that particular day, I did meet someone and he was heading north. There's great camaraderie when you meet these people. I stopped and we talked and I told him of my plans to hike around the crater rim. And he told me that a lot of the crater rim had collapsed in and it's very unstable there. So I thought about this and I changed my plans. I said, I'll actually go into the volcano itself, right down into the crater floor, and I'll hike across the crater floor to the south side and continue on my way. Now, I didn't know at the time, but when I came home from Ireland, I googled it. I just wanted to see, is there anything up there about this collapse on the crater rim? There might be something there. And I discovered that five days before I was actually in this volcano, five million cubic metres of rock tumbled down, a big landslide of the crater rim on the, on the south side of it. Now, there's a lake right in the crater floor. It's about 12 kilometres square. And all this material fell into the lake and created a tsunami with waves of about 200 feet high. And five days later, there I was, hiking across the crater Knew floor. nothing about it? Nothing about it, no. No. God, that's scary when you think Yeah, you yeah, think when you think about it. But there was it, no yeah. issue when you were there. You there were was no issue when I was by. there. No issue when I was there at all, no. Um, you couldn't light a fire. I, I was going to come on to, to the point, and you just touched it there. You didn't meet many people on your way, the no, odd person. No, the odd person. As I got further south, I met a few people. Um, in the mountains in the south... The, uh, the Fjallbach Nature Reserve, there is a dedicated hiking trail. It's a, four, it's a 55 kilometre long hiking trail and it's blazed every 100 metres. And tourists come on to hike this trail. It's a beautiful trail. So I decided as I was going south, I might as well take this route. I actually done it in three days. But along that route, I, I met people along that route every day. But other than that now, there's not, I didn't meet many at all. I was on my own basically most of the way. And... When you were before, I did say to you, you, your health is good and you're a fit lad and you, mm. you, you, you know, you keep yourself right and that as well. In an emergency situation here, you had the phone, if, if anything went yes, wrong. Yes, yes. I, I brought a mobile phone with me. Now, I didn't expect to, to be using it. I didn't expect to get coverage mm. at all. But very strangely, I was able to use the phone every single day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I which, was able to ring my wife every evening. Mm. So you're hundreds, hundreds of kilometres away from anywhere. And you have a mobile phone, and it works. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's it's a real good yeah, story. Yeah. So you've done this now. That is Sweden last time, just nearer to the Arctic Circle, just below it at this stage. Mm. Uh, you're only home, sure. You're going to have to settle back into work and family life yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. Paul, you're hardly thinking of anything else at this stage. Well, there's there's always something going on in the back of my mind. I'm always thinking of something. When I'm away on a trip, I'm thinking of other trips. There's always something going on in the back of my mind. Now, I don't have plans yet at the moment, but when I was in Iceland, crossing the deserts and the lack of life, the lack of colour, I began to think of trees. I'd love if there was a few trees around. So I I began thinking of the, the, the taiga forest. And maybe maybe some of the taiga forest areas in Finland. I'd love to go up there and do some hiking through there. My God, he's planning on it. (laughs) It's just an idea. And his good (laughs) wife is here with him and she's thrown her eyes up to heaven on the other (laughs) side of the studio here as he says that. I wish you luck with that Mm. one. On reflection, you know, you've done a lot of this in your lifetime. You've been in many, many different places. How would you assess Iceland? Well, Iceland is very unique. I don't think there's anywhere like it on the planet. It's very strange. It's so surreal. The landscapes are very... Tolkien-esque. I've never seen anything like it before. There was mountains I was climbing and they were, they were yellow. There was mountains that were purple. They were red. There was blue mountains. All these strange volcanic rocks and colours all mix, mixed in. It was so surreal, so strange. A very... Um, when you're hiking through this area and you're looking at the landscape, you're thinking just, did someone, did someone hang a picture in front of me? Is this painted? It doesn't seem real. And when I came home, I was trying to get all, I was trying to run all this through my head. It's, it's a very strange feeling. A beautiful, beautiful place. There's also parts in Iceland 
uh, where you could be hiking for days and it's monotonous grey and solidified lava and volcanic ash black and grey is the only colour you see and then all of a sudden you're in a completely different area there might be um, green green moss what do you think green moss isn't much but when it's against the black background it just stands out I found myself standing there looking at blades of grass and little bits of moss and if you can see the beauty in a blade of grass and a little bit of moss you go a long way it does it, it, it does go a long way mm. and it just shows you the contrast yeah. finding your way from mm. point A to point B how did you do that? yeah well I'm old school and I, I don't use GPS I never have I don't believe in them I just use map and compass but there are places in Iceland where the the, the volcanic rock has a lot of metal content in it and sometimes you, the the magnetic needle on your compass might spin around so it, it's rendered useless so I use the sun a lot of the time there's times I often got my trekking pole which, which is like a walking stick it's like a ski pole and I'd stick it in the ground it would give a shadow now if you think about it the sun rises in the east it moves across the southern sky and sets in the west the shadow it produces moves completely the opposite way. So I'd stick my pole in the ground and I'd put a little stone on the end of the shadow. I'd wait 20 minutes. The shadow would move and I'd draw a line from the stone over to the pole and that would give me a line east-west. I'd dissect that and it would give me north-south. These type of things I used. So I, I used the sun, um, I used the uh, prevailing winds, things like that to, to find my direction a lot. So lot you time. weren't depending on technology? You weren't no. depending even on the simplicity of the magnetic field of a compass or whatever mm. in case it went yeah, wrong? Yeah. You used... It, nature. Nature. Yeah, yeah. He's a wonderful guy, isn't he? Delighted to meet him again on Late Lunch. Watch this space. There will be another instalment. And whenever that is, Paul Shields, make sure you drop back to tell us all okay, about it. OK, thanks very much, Thank Jerry. you so Thank much you for, for joining me. me again on Late Lunch today. OK. 